This short tutorial is designed to go through the iodine clock reaction simulation and to help you with the calculations. Now, you've run the simulation already and you have data and now we're going to say what are we going to do with this. Now one of the big ideas is we've seen problems like this where if we give you this initial rate information then you can figure out the orders of the reaction, figure out the rate law, and figure out the value for K. So what we're going to do here is to get these, you know, calculate these values from our lab data, from our simulation data, and then go on and solve the problem. So we start with the idea that for this reaction we're using iodate, and iodate is a good oxidizing agent, and it's changing iodide into triiodide. So in the middle of this picture over on the right, you can see the three iodines together in a linear fashion, and that's the triiodide. And what happens is all surrounded is surrounded by starch. So when starch and iodine go together, they form this blue-black solution. So this picture on the on the upper right shows you why this little blue stuff forms in the solution. Now the triiodide then mixes with starch. But as we mix these things together, before they actually have a chance to react, okay, this uh, reducing agent, arsenious acid in this case, comes in and changes our uh, triiodide ion back into iodide. So you can see what happens. Here we have iodide turning into triiodide, but faster than your eye can see, the triiodide is returned to iodide. So the actual reaction, when we're waiting for the uh, clock reaction to change color, is we're waiting to, until we can use up all of this arsenious acid that happens to be in the reaction. So the rate of our reaction, which is supposed to be the rate of iodide, iodate, is really, we can calculate it by taking the rate of uh, the how long it takes for the 0 0.0015 molar arsenious acid to be used up, and since um, we are making, okay, three, okay, I've kind of got this covered up. I'm going to clear my ink. Okay, every time one iodate gets used up, we make three triiodides, which we can see are going to use up three of our acetous acids. So the rate of our reaction is one-third the concentration of our acetous acid, which is 0 0.0015 divided by T. So that means all we have to do to figure out the rate of any reaction, any of our reactions, is just take 0 0.0005, which is 0 0.0015 times one-third, and divide that by our time, and that'll give us our rate. And officially that's the rate of our senius acid. Well, you go back for your data, okay, and you've collected your data, and you've gotten four different average times, and the idea is you're going to turn those into four different rates for this equation. So you're going to use this uh, rate equation up here to change each of these into one of the rates. Now, once you get that done, then you can go back and say, okay, here we have a nice, you know, uh, problem like we've seen before, uh, when you know one thing changes, you know, the this concentration doubles. Let me clear a place. Okay, when this concentration doubles, where this one stays the same, this one stays the same, you know, what happens to the rate? So if the rate doubles, it's first order, second order, third order, that kind of stuff. So we can use that to get our rate law. Then after that, once we figure the orders, then we can write the rate equation, and then we can go back and solve for K. So these are standard things for us to do. Figure out the orders, write the rate equation, and then uh, get a value for K. Well, here's uh, Mr. Papadakis and my data. Okay, when we went through, and we're showing here, this is our sample calculation, just showing how we did the first one. So you can see what we're doing. One-third of 0 .0015 divided by our time, 18.7 seconds. And so we get a rate of 2.67 times 10 to the minus 5 uh, moles per liter per second. Now, by doing that and checking our chart, we found out that it's a one first order, second order, second order for these three chemicals. So we have our rate law. And then, just like we've done before, we solve for K. So K is equal to the rate divided by these concentrations, where we substitute those values in from our data chart. 
and we can get a value for our k. And that's important. So this is how we kind of finish off part one of this uh, love tutorial is to find the orders of all the chemicals, write a rate law, and solve for k. Now for the second part of this, we're going to go back and say, well, what happens if we change the temperature okay, from 5 degrees to 45 degrees? And we know what's going to happen is that it's going to go faster and faster. The warmer it is, the faster the reaction. So our times are going to start kind of large and get smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, if we have these times, okay, these five different times, then we can turn those into five different rates by again using our, our rate equation, rate formula. So we take these times that we collected, turn them into five rates. Now what else do we have going on? These temperatures, we're just going to change these temperatures into kelvins because we need those later. And if we have five rates, then we can figure out five values of k. And we can see just like we did before in the uh, problem is we said if we have uh, the rate equation, okay, then we can calculate k just by solving for k. So using rates and using these uh, concentrations, we can solve for k. So if we have these five rates, then we can figure out these five new k's. And we're going to use that data to calculate the activation energy. We'll see that in a moment. Now here's some of our values. So we started off, we found out that at five degrees, very pretty cool. It took a long time, and then it got you know faster and faster and faster and faster as the temperature increased. Now these temperatures here are just uh, temperatures in Celsius plus 273. Okay, we took these numbers and used our rate equation and figured out our rate. And if we knew the rate, we could solve for k and figure out our value for k. Now going back and just like we did in question three and four, that if we have a rate, we can solve for k. So now for questions, uh, up in question six, we just happen to mention that the value of R we're going to use later is 8.31, 8.314 actually. Okay, joules per mole Kelvin. The uh, ideal Cass law constant R just keeps showing up over and over and over in different chapters. Now here in number seven, we're saying take this calculation thing we've done, and let me get a new color here. And all we're going to do is take this temperature and go and put it in this chart. That's all we've done. And we've taken our value of K and we've taken and put it over here in this chart. So on this chart, we're not doing anything new. We're just copying our data over. Now that we have our temperature, we're just going to take 1 divided by the temperature. So just take this number, say 1 divided by 278, and put it here. 1 divided by 288, etc., etc. Just fill those in. And the same way, here we have k that we calculated, and now we just want to figure out natural log of k. So just take the natural log of all these values, and that will get us those values. And we'll see why in a minute. Now, the Arrhenius equation, which I really should have mentioned before, uh, is this kind of odd equation, and it's put together by Sponte Arrhenius. And the idea is that this A it has to do with the uh, um, orientation of the molecules, E sub A, recognize that, that is our activation energy. R is the ideal gas constant, 8.314. T is temperature in Kelvin. And K is our constant, you know, our, our uh, um, rate constant. Well, we can take and take the natural log of both sides and get an equation like this. We can rearrange it into Y equals MX plus B. And the reason we want to do that is that says if we take our data for several different temperatures, and our x-axis is 1 over the temperature, and our y-axis is natural log of k, and we plot those values, they will lay on a straight line. So this is Mr. Pavarakis and my data. Okay, and it works out pretty close to a straight line, so we have good data. Let's go back. So that's what we've done here. Okay, I'm getting a new color. Um, that if you take this data here, okay, I'm going to clean up this page again. Okay, if we take this column here that we just mathematically did, okay, that's our 1 over t. And for our y-axis, we have all these values, our ln of k. We're going to plot those against each other. 
and we get our graph over here and this is actually from our data so we take a our ln of k and our 1 over the temperature and we get that nice straight line so from this what we learn right here is that the slope of that line so I'm going to take two points usually my endpoints and I'll figure out my rise I'm going to figure out my run okay and just divide one by the other so it gives me my slope that equals negative activation energy divided by R so the slope we've calculated so we have that value we have uh, R which we know is you know uh, point, uh, 8.314 and you get rid of the negative sign and then whatever we have left here then so I'm going to take my slope multiply by R change the sign and that will give me my activation energy which is the last thing I want to do in this simulation and that's in a nutshell all the calculations that's it